Um, I just want to say, starting off, I, I talked to Brando about this a little bit before I started. In fact, he was the first per person at the center I talked about this idea when it emerged. And I just want to say, if you're living an emotionally restrictive life, you might want to consider doing this. Because when the idea first came out, I well, was we so excited. And then about two weeks ago, when it started to get real, it started to get a little more anxious. And now I'm scared to death. <laughs> but it'll be over soon, and I'll be joyful again. So put yourself through this emotional experience if you want to feel a full range of emotions. Um, so this title was so long, actually I forgot it after I talked to Annie about it when I first thought of it. I think the title that I gave her at that time was Don't Be Afraid to Be Hard on Yourself. But as I would, well, um, or longer title, How Being Hard on Yourself is an Essential to the Spiritual Path. As I awakened one Sunday morning about six or seven weeks ago, I found myself thinking about and planning the entire sermon for this morning. It came to me in a brilliant flash and just laid out as I lay in bed. I made an error and didn't write down those reflections at that time. Once I sat down to write my ideas for the sermon, I found that much of the clarity I had from that morning had fled. I'll let you decide if that mistake was a blessing on my spiritual path or a missed opportunity. One thing did stand out in my memory. I found myself thinking about how three of my close friends from the center and my own experiences have taught me how important it is to face mistakes. It is necessary to acknowledge them, learn from them, and trust that such rigorous honesty will lead to becoming a better person. One of those friends is Rob Fagerlin. Every one of you who has survived the pandemic with us at, through Interfaith has come to know Rob. It is he and Vicki Davinich who have been the greeters on Zoom every single Sunday since March 2020. Well, at least Rob has been. I think Vicki has attended the center a few times in person while Rob kept watch on Zoom. When there was only one way to participate or view this service, you could not go on Zoom without encountering Rob or Vicki. And it's still true today when you use Zoom. In addition, he was the originator of the idea and has been at the hub of the execution of the center's social hours on Wednesday and Friday afternoons throughout the pandemic. To my knowledge, he has not missed a Sunday service or any afternoon social hour now in more than two years. Before he did these services, he was the center's librarian, sorting the books, shelving them, and publicizing some of the outstanding titles with humorous anecdotes. He has given much to the center for so long, so consistently. However, he is not without flaws. <laughs> In fact, he shared the story with us. <laughs> that was unnecessary, though. <laughs> In fact, he shared the story with us during one of the social hours that a friend chastised him and forbade him from making deprecating marks, remarks about himself. Shortly after he told us how much he took that, uh, this advice to heart, he did that very thing. He is candid about the severity of a head injury he suffered several years ago. He continues to discuss how hard his recovery has been and how hard he has been on himself about the deficits created by that injury. Just the Friday before the Sunday that this sermon idea first emerged, I heard him speak at the social hour about being an old fogey, stuck in his ways and contrary to change. In the same session, he talked about feeling that he never grew up and how he felt unbelievable admiration for his beloved Bonnie, that she has been able to tolerate his immaturity for all these years. So which is it? He's an old fogey or he's an immature young lad? Or could it be both? What is all of this if not a willingness to take a close look, a deep, self-reflective, unsparing look at one's foibles? 
I, for one, believe that Rob has consistently shown growth and change in the wake of his injury. This, in turn, has been central to his ability to give invaluable service to this community. Thanks for the affirmation. I'm feeling a little embarrassed because I keep having to read this. I wish I could memorize it. I mean, when Maurice did her meditation, like, transported without ever reading anything, I went one day. Anyway, a second friend who, is, who bears scrutiny is my good friend Al Carter. <laughs> Al appears to revel in his uniqueness. He never seems to take offense at people mocking some of his outrageous pronouncements or costumes or behaviors. Who but Al could have thought of the term Grand Poobah of the Cafe 704? Who else could have dared to think of such an outrageous title and use it so liberally? Who else would revel at holding the title of King of Fools drawn from the Ann Arbor's earliest April Fool's Day's festivities? who would then be bold enough to take on anyone who chooses to challenge his claim to that throne. <laughs> Al is ready with stories from a lifetime of interesting experiences. Many of these experiences were as a teacher, an outdoor enthusiast, and a supervisor within the State Department of Natural Resources. He has repeatedly mined these experiences to explain many peculiar situations and odd behaviors. Al continues to refuse to take himself too seriously and welcomes a critique from anyone who chooses to offer any. <laughs> I see him nodding in agreement. However, could anyone but Al have pulled off and maintained the Cafe 704? One person thought to replicate it on the fourth Saturday of every month and found himself giving up in frustration after only three months. Al had the vision to believe that the cafe could make a profound difference in the center. During the pandemic, it has been a mainstay. It has been a means for people to come together, live and in person, as well as on Zoom. We are able to share this treasured activity and the social occasion surrounding it. Many of us have come to feel it as a vital part of the center and something we can all feel is a significant part of our connection to the center. It took lots of humility to bring it to fruition. I remember when Al began by approaching musicians throughout the city to see who would be willing to come and play in our limited space for a mere 50% of the gate. Think of the humbling experience it was to approach such noted artists as Laz and San Slamovitz, Mad Cat Ruth, Dorchestra, and Paul Verhagen, to name but a few. Think of asking them to come to this out-of-the-way location to play for such a limited audience. Think of the courage it takes get, to get them to commit months in advance and to keep coming back year after year. His vision was to bring them and their audience to the concert and expose those people to the center. His hope was that this would not only produce some revenue but also create some new members for the center for bring people who have not otherwise heard of our, of our program here. Such is the courage, vision, and humility of my friend Al Carter. I think his skill at taking a hard look at himself in terms of his talents, as well as his shortcomings, play a central role in his service to this community. My third friend is the newest of the three. I met Paulette Stenzel while dancing at the top of the park three years ago with her daughter. You gonna put her on the central screen? To... Okay, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I haven't said anything offensive yet, I suppose. That's why you were hesitating. Anyway, I met, uh, uh, she knew of our center because her brother Martin was a longtime member. She remembered fondly and deeply appreciates to this day the words she heard from Dallas at her brother's memorial service. When we met, she was a newly retired professor from the business school in our rival University of Michigan State. She continues her involvement with the center as a board member from her remote location in East Lansing. Today she comes to us from um, 
remote little town on the west side of the state, um, Douglas, where she's vacationing with her daughter and her daughter's friend. She's also delivered two sermons since coming to us. I mentioned that she is a retired faculty member, only she is not. You see, Paulette is a self-confessed educator. She doesn't seem to be able to leave the teaching behind. She has been doing battle in the sexist environment of the business school with her male colleagues for years. She would love to move away from that aggravation. However, she is committed to fair trade and sustainability as sound and important business practices. Moreover, she knows that when she leaves, there will be little interest in maintaining the vitality of those areas in the MSU business school curriculum. More than that, she is committed to critical thinking. She has long orchestrated her classes to bring that or force that out of her students. She has observed the contrasting teaching styles of her male counterparts. Still, she knows how important it is to America that critical thinking is within the skill set for business leaders of the future. So she feels that there is a vital role that she needs to continue to play. Thus, she continues to be a part-time, underpaid and underappreciated instructor in the place that is, she has called her employment home for more than 30 years. Her family does not appreciate her efforts, with the sole exception of the aforementioned daughter. This has led to repetitive cycles of self-examination. She routinely takes a hard look at what she is doing, what she has accomplished, and why she continues to do what she does. The answers she gets from these reflections are not entirely satisfying, but she knows in her heart that through this self-examination and ongoing commitment, she will continue to do what she knows so well to do. She also knows that it feeds her soul, as does her commitment and involvement with the center she is now calls her spiritual home. Well, by now, you must be asking yourself, how can he be so thorough and painstaking in his appraisal of his friends? When will he turn the microscope on himself? <laughs> of course, I know myself and my style of communication well enough to know that this talk has probably taken too much of your time already. <laughs> I am relatively certain that I've gone over my time already. However, it would be unfair to look so closely at my friends and to ignore my impulse or shirk my responsibility to take a hard look at myself. So I will start with the physical. I have been bald for so long that I can only dimly remember when I had hair. As much as I want to deny its validity, and others have encouraged me to do so, the BMI measurement convicts me of being obese. <laughs> Those who know me well know that I talk too much and too long. More than that, I can get angry at the drop of a hat and have been terrible at expressing that anger appropriately. I've been known to be arrogant. I've known to be petulant. I do not like to be criticized. I like to apologize even less. I am a not so recovering addict. I readily acknowledge my addiction to alcohol, marijuana, sex, love, television, and dancing. I believe that I have become better over time in keeping most of these in check. But I continue to work on my love addiction. I see my addiction to television as a hopeless cause and have no desire to control my addiction to dancing. So with this hard look at my most obvious flaws, if my premise is correct, can I count on the spiritual growth that my title promises? I can see the promise fulfilled in each of my three friends, and I esteem them highly for their accomplishments, the evidence of their spiritual growth, and their value to the center. I will let each of you who know me judge if I have the capacity or the likelihood for the growth that they have experienced or the stellar accomplishments they have achieved. Still, I would invite you to draw from their examples, if not my own to have the courage to take a hard look. I know we are a group that emphasizes feeling good, being spiritually vibrant, 
and being a positive force in the world. Still, I'm relatively certain that we cannot sustain any of these things if we are unwilling to grow. I question whether we can grow if we are not willing to take on the humility to look at our shadow side, confront it, and use this vision to transform ourselves. So I wish you good luck with your own ongoing inward search. That was to be the end of the sermon until I did my spiritual reading this morning and encountered this reading today. It's for today's reading in this book called Medication, Meditations for Men Who Do Too Much. And it just seemed so appropriate. Oh, it's print smaller, I'm gonna have to use my glasses. This is a quote from Tallulah Bankhead. If I had my life to live again, I'd make the same mistakes, only sooner. We not only make mistakes, but we repeat them endlessly. To make changes takes too much time. To make choices use up, uses up valuable energy. So we repeat the past, even if it's not worth repeating. We use the same old script rather than take the time to write a new one. I think Tallulah Bankhead's message really means more than it seems at first. I think implied in the sarcasm is the hope that she would learn from those early mistakes, thus allowing the rest of her life more balance, making it less terrifying. Because I don't have my life to live over, I will, not, I will be more aware of what I'm doing with this one. I do not want to make the same mistakes and will be more vigilant in taking care of myself. Thanks.